The sack of Amorium by the Abbasid Caliphate in mid-August 838 was one of the major events in the long history of the Arab-Byzantine Wars. The Abbasid campaign was led personally by the Caliph al-Mutazim, in retaliation to a virtually unopposed expedition launched by the Byzantine Emperor Theophilos into the Caliphate's borderlands the previous year. Mutazim targeted Amorium, a Byzantine city in Western Asia Minor, because it was the birthplace of the ruling Byzantine dynasty and, at the time, one of Byzantium's largest and most important cities. The caliph gathered an exceptionally large army, which he divided in two parts, which invaded from the northeast and the south. The northeastern army defeated the Byzantine forces under Theophilos at Anzin, allowing the Abbasids to penetrate deep into Byzantine-held Asia Minor and converge upon Ansira, which they found abandoned. After sacking the city, they turned south to Amorium, where they arrived on 1 August. Faced with intrigues at Constantinople and the rebellion of the large Kuramite contingent of his army, Theophilos was unable to aid the city. Amorium was strongly fortified and garrisoned, but a traitor revealed a weak spot in the wall where the Abbasids concentrated their attack, affecting a breach. Unable to break through the besieging army, Oiditzes, the commander of the breach section privately attempted to negotiate with the caliph without notifying his superiors. He concluded a local truce and left his post, which allowed the Arabs to take advantage, enter the city and capture it. Amorium was systematically destroyed, never to recover its former prosperity. Many of its inhabitants were slaughtered, and the remainder driven off as slaves. Most of the survivors were released after a truce in 841, but prominent officials were taken to the caliph's capital of Samarra and executed years later after refusing to convert to Islam, becoming known as the 42 Martyrs of Amorium. The conquest of Amorium was not only a major military disaster and a heavy personal blow for Theophilos but also a traumatic event for the Byzantines, its impact resonating in later literature. The sack did not ultimately alter the balance of power, which was slowly shifting in Byzantium's favor, but it thoroughly discredited the theological doctrine of iconoclasm, ardently supported by Theophilos, as iconoclasm relied heavily on military success for its legitimization. The fall of Amorium contributed decisively to its abandonment shortly after Theophilos's death in 842. Background By 829, when the young emperor Theophilos ascended the Byzantine throne, the Byzantines and Arabs had been fighting on and off for almost two centuries. At this time, Arab attacks resumed both in the east where after almost 20 years of peace due to the Abbasid civil war Caliph al Mamun launched several large-scale raids, and in the west, where the gradual Muslim conquest of Sicily was underway since 827. Theophilos was an ambitious man and also a convinced adherent of Byzantine iconoclasm, which prohibited the depiction of divine figures and the veneration of icons. He sought to bolster his regime and support his religious policies by military success against the Abbasid Caliphate, the empire's major antagonist, seeking divine favor, and responding to iconophile plots against him. Theophilos reinstated active suppression of the iconophiles and other perceived heretics in June 833, including mass arrests and exiles beatings and confiscations of property. In Byzantine eyes, God seemed indeed to reward this decision. al mamun died during the first stages of a new, large-scale invasion against Byzantium that was intended to be the first step in conquering Constantinople itself, and his brother and successor al mutazim withdrew to focus on internal matters, having trouble establishing his authority and needing to confront the ongoing rebellion of the Kuramite religious sect under Babak Khoramdin. This allowed Theophilos to achieve a series of modest victories over the next few years, as well as to bolster his forces with some 14,000 Kuramite refugees under their leader Nasser. 
who was baptized a Christian and took the name Theophobus. The emperor's successes were not particularly spectacular, but coming after two decades of defeats and civil war under iconophile emperors, Theophilos felt justified in claiming them as vindication for his religious policy. Consequently, the emperor began to publicly associate himself with the memory of the militarily successful and fanatically iconoclast emperor Constantine V, and issued a new type of the copper follis coin, minted in huge numbers, which portrayed him as the archetypical victorious Roman emperor. In 837, Theophilus decided, at the urging of the hard-pressed Babic, to take advantage of the caliphate's preoccupation with the suppression of the Kurumite revolt and lead a major campaign against the frontier emirates. He assembled a very large army, some 70,000 fighting men and 100,000 in total according to Al-Tabari, and invaded Arab territory around the upper Euphrates almost unopposed. The Byzantines took the towns of Sizopatre and Arsamosata, ravaged and plundered the countryside, extracted ransom from several cities in exchange for not attacking them, and defeated a number of smaller Arab forces. While Theophilos returned home to celebrate a triumphant be acclaimed in the Hippodrome of Constantinople as the incomparable champion, the refugees from Sizopatre began arriving at Mutasim's capital, Samara. The caliphal court was outraged by the brutality and brazenness of the raids. Not only had the Byzantines acted in open collusion with the Kurumite rebels, but during the sack of Sizopatre, which some sources claim as Mutasim's own birthplace, all male prisoners were executed and the rest sold into slavery, and some captive women were raped by Theophilos's Kurumites. Theophilos's campaign was unable, however, to save Babak and his followers, who in late 837 were forced from their mountain strongholds by the general Afshan. Babak fled to Armenia, but was betrayed to the Abbasids and died of torture. With the Kurumite threat over, the Caliph began marshalling his forces for a reprisal campaign against Byzantium. A huge Arab army gathered at Tarsus, according to the most reliable account, that of Michael the Syrian. It numbered some 80,000 men with 30,000 servants and camp followers and 70,000 pack animals. Other writers give far larger numbers, ranging from 200,000 to 500,000 according to al masudi Unlike earlier campaigns, which did not go far beyond attacking the forts of the frontier zone, this expedition was intended to penetrate deep into Asia Minor and exact vengeance. The great city of Amorium in particular was the intended prize. The Arab chronicles record that Mutazim asked his advisers to name the most inaccessible and strongest Byzantine fortress, and they named Amorium, where no Muslim has gone since the appearance of Islam. It is the iron foundation of Christendom. Among the Byzantines, it is more famous than Constantinople. According to Byzantine sources, the Caliph had the city's name written on the shields and banners of his soldiers. The capital of the powerful Anatolic theme, the city was strategically located at the western edge of the Anatolian plateau and controlled the main southern route followed by the Arab invasions. At the time, Amorium was one of the largest cities in the Byzantine Empire, ranking in importance immediately after Constantinople. It was also the birthplace of Theophilos's father, Michael II the Amorian, and perhaps of Theophilos himself. Due to its strategic importance, the city had been a frequent target of Arab attacks in the 7th and 8th centuries and Mutasim's predecessor Marman was said to be planning to attack the city when he died in 833, opening stages of the campaign, Anzin and Nansira. The caliph divided his force in two. A detachment of 10,000 Turks under Afshan was sent northeast to join forces with the emir of Malatya Umar al-Aqta and Armenian troops and invade the Armeniac theme from the pass of Hadath while the main army under the caliph himself would invade Cappadocia through the Cilician gates. The advance guard of the latter was led by Ashinas, with attack commanding the right. 
Jafar ibn Dinar al Kayat the left and Uj Fibin and Basso the center. The two forces would link up at Ansira before marching jointly on Amorium. On the Byzantine side, Theophilos was soon made aware of the caliph's intentions and set out from Constantinople in early June. His army included men from the Anatolian and possibly also the European themes, the elite Tagmata regiments, as well as the Kurumites. The Byzantines expected the Arab army to advance north to Ansira after passing through the Cilician gates and then to turn south toward Amorium. But it was also possible that the Arabs would march directly over the Cappadocian plain to Amorium, although his generals advised evacuation of the city with the intention of rendering the Arabs' campaign objective void and keeping the Byzantine army undivided. Theophilus decided to reinforce the city's garrison, with Aetius the strategos of the Anatolics, and men from the Tagmata of the Excubitors and the Vigla. With the rest of his army, Theophilus then marched to interpose himself between the Cilician Gates and Ansira. Camping on the north bank of the river Halis, close to one of the major river crossings, Ashinas crossed the Cilician gates on the 19th of June, and the caliph himself, with his main army, set out on the march two days later. The Arab advance was slow and cautious, anxious to avoid an ambush and learn the emperor's whereabouts. Mutors aim for bad Ashinas to advance too deeply into Cappadocia. Ashinas sent out many scouting detachments to take captives, and from him finally learned of Theophilos's presence at the Halis, where he awaited the Arab approach to give battle. At the same time, around mid-July, Theophilos learned of the arrival of Afshan's army, comprising some 30,000 men, at the plain of Dazimon, leaving a part of his army under a relative to watch the crossings of the Halos. Theophilos immediately departed with most of his army, some 40,000 men according to Michael the Syrian, to confront the smaller Arab force. Mutorzim learned of Theophilos's departure from captives and tried to warn Afshan. But the emperor was faster in met Afshan's army in the Battle of Anzan on the plain of Dazimon on the 22nd of July. Despite initial success, the Byzantine army broke and scattered. While Theophilos with his guard were encircled and barely managed to break through and escape, Theophilos quickly began regrouping his forces and sent the general Theodore Craterus to Ansira. Craterus found the city completely deserted, and was ordered to reinforce the garrison of Amorium instead. Theophilos himself was soon forced to return to Constantinople, where rumors of his death at Anzin had led to plots to declare a new emperor. At the same time, the Kuramites, gathered around Sinope, revolted and declared their reluctant commander Theophobus emperor. Luckily for the empire, Theophobus maintained a passive stance and made no move to confront Theophilos or join Mutorzim. The caliph's vanguard under Ashinas reached Hansira on 26 July. The inhabitants, who had sought refuge in some mines nearby, were discovered and taken captive after a brief struggle by an Arab detachment under Malik ibn Qadar al-Safadi. The Byzantines, some of whom were soldiers who had fled from Anzan, informed the Arabs of Afshan's victory after which Malik allowed all of them to go free. The other Arab forces arrived at Ansira over the next days, and after plundering the deserted city, the United Arab Army turned south towards Amorium. Siege and fall of Amorium. The Arab army marched in three separate corps, with Ashinas once again in front, the Caliph in the middle, and Afshan bringing up the rear, looting the countryside as they advanced. They arrived before Amorium seven days after their departure from Ansira, and began their siege of the city on the 1st of August. Theophilos, anxious to prevent the city's fall, left Constantinople for Dorylion, and from there sent an embassy to Mutorzim. His envoys, who arrived shortly before or during the first days of the siege, offered assurances that the atrocities at his opatre had been against the emperor's orders, and further promised to help rebuild the city, to return all Muslim prisoners, and to pay a tribute. 
the caliph, however, not only refused to parley with the envoys, but detained them in his camp, so that they could observe the siege. The city's fortifications were strong, with a wide moat and a thick wall protected by 44 towers. According to the contemporary geographer Ibn Khordad there, the caliph assigned each of his generals to a stretch of the walls. Both besiegers and besieged had many siege engines, and for three days both sides exchanged missile fire while Arab sappers tried to undermine the walls. According to Arab accounts, an Arab prisoner who had converted to Christianity defected back to the caliph, and informed him about a place in the wall which had been badly damaged by heavy rainfall and only hastily and superficially repaired due to the city commander's negligence. As a result, the Arabs concentrated their efforts on this section. The defenders tried to protect the wall by hanging wooden beams to absorb the shock of the siege engines, but they splintered, and after two days a breach was made. Immediately Aetius realized that the defense was compromised. Ing decided to try and break through the besieging army during the night and link up with Theophilos. He sent two messengers to the emperor, but both were captured by the Arabs and brought before the caliph. Both agreed to convert to Islam, and Mutazim, after giving them a rich reward, paraded them around the city walls in full view of Aetius and his troops. To prevent any sortie, the Arabs stepped up their vigilance, maintaining constant cavalry patrols even during the night. The Arabs now launched repeated attacks on the breach, but the defenders held firm. At first, according to Al-Tabari, catapults manned by four men each were placed on wheeled platforms, and mobile towers with ten men each were constructed and advanced to the edge of the moat which they began to fill with sheep skins filled with earth. However, the work was uneven due to the soldiers' fear of the Byzantine catapults, and Mutazim had to order earth to be thrown over the skins to pave the surface up to the wall itself. A tower was pushed over the filled moat, but became stuck midway and it and the other siege engines had to be abandoned and burned. Another attack on the next day, led by Ashinas, failed due to the narrowness of the breach, and Mutazim eventually ordered more catapults brought forward to widen it. The next day Afshin with his troops attacked the breach, and attack on the day after. The Byzantine defenders were gradually worn down by the constant assaults, and after about two weeks of siege Aetius sent an embassy under the city's bishop offering to surrender Amorium in exchange for safe passage of the inhabitants and garrison, but Mutazim refused. The Byzantine commander Boyditzis, however, who was in charge of the breach section, decided to conduct direct negotiations with the caliph on his own, probably intending to betray his own post. He went to the Abbasid camp, leaving orders for his men in the breach to stand down until his return. While Boyditzes parleyed with the caliph, the Arabs came closer to the breach, and at a signal charged and broke into the city. Taken by surprise, the Byzantines' resistance was sporadic. Some soldiers barricaded themselves in a monastery and were burned to death. While Aetius with his officers sought refuge in a tower before being forced to surrender, the city was thoroughly sacked and plundered. According to the Arab accounts, the sale of the spoils went on for five days. The Byzantine chronicler Theophanes Continuatus mentions 70,000 dead, while the Arab Almasidi records 30,000. The surviving population were divided as slaves among the army leaders, except for the city's military and civic leaders, who were reserved for the caliph's disposal. After allowing Theophilos's envoys to return to him with the news of Amorium's fall, Mutazim burned the city to the ground, with only the city walls surviving relatively intact. Among the spoils taken were the massive iron doors of the city, which Al-Mutazim initially transported to Samara, where they were installed at the entrance of his palace. From there they were taken, probably towards the end of the century, and installed at al rakar where they remained until 964, when the Hamdanid ruler Saif al dawla had them removed and incorporated in the Bab al-Qanasrin gate in his capital Aleppo.